Come on, well, we want to welcome you around the world. We are excited. Come on. We are so excited to have you with us, especially if you are here for the very, very first time. And if that's the case, whether you're joining us digitally in one of our home churches, Firestarters, or one of our locations, welcome. And thank you so much. Thank you for coming and being a part of church today. We are so, so glad that you're here. And if you are here for the first time, over the next couple of weeks, we as a church are watching through an incredible TV series called The Chosen. Um, Who's already watched some of it, anybody? But you can connect in and watch with us because we, it's an incredible, incredible creative depiction of the life of Jesus. And I absolutely love it because if you ever had those moments in life where you see people, somebody just from like a, you just see them in a new way, you know, maybe it's a family member or a friend and you find out something about them or they do something unexpected and you just see them in a whole nother light. That's the heart of this series, that as we look at Jesus, we're going to see him, we're going to see how he acted, we're going to see what he did just from a different angle. And already we're hearing as a leadership team about the impact of this. People saying, I'm in tears watching this, I'm just seeing Seeing God from another angle, that's the heart of what we're doing. But one of the things that I love about The Chosen is not just that we get to see Jesus from a whole other angle, but actually we get to see ourselves as well. Because one of the things I love about this series is the way that they depict the different characters of the Bible. And the reason I love it is because I personally can identify with so many of them in so many different ways. We're going to be talking a lot about episode one. So if you haven't watched The Chosen, that's great. You can jump in this week and be talking a lot about episode one. But you meet characters like Matthew. Now, Matthew, if you don't know the kind of Bible story, Matthew is a young man who really finds himself in a, in a pretty much a terrible place between a rock and a hard place. And we're not sure whether that was because of his own decisions or because of circumstances around him, but he's a tax collector. And he really is between a rock and a hard place because he's a Jew, but he's collecting taxes for the Romans. So his people hate him and think he's scum and the Romans hate him because he's a Jew and he's, he's trapped. And the thing that seems to really come across about Matthew his life is that he just doesn't feel like he's got a way out. Yeah. Ever felt like that? Yeah. I know I can identify with that. Yeah. Moments where I don't feel I can go right and get out that way. Moments where I don't feel I can go left and get out that way. And yet Jesus comes into Matthew's life and brings freedom and direction. Or maybe you would identify with Simon Peter. <laughs> Whose favourite is Peter? I think lots of people, we love Peter in this church, but the way that they depict Peter is this cheeky, kind of rebellious, you know, almost quite naughty sort of character, a bit of a maverick. Um, But one of the things that he's he's basically struggling with debt. He can't pay his bills. And I think there's going to be a lot of us in our world right now that can identify with that. And he's running around, he's trying to solve it himself. His wife always saying to him, you're never trusting God, you're trying to do it on your own. When I heard that line, I was like, that's me. (laughs) Anybody else willing to be honest with yourselves, right? He's going to kind of bend the lines of law for his needs. Anybody else? (laughs) Come on, you were in church. Maybe we can identify with him. Maybe we identify with Nicodemus, right? Total other end of the spectrum. He's a religious leader. Um, He's got influence. He's got wealth. He's got power. And yet he's got everything the world could offer him, but something is still nagging at him. Maybe you find yourself in church today and you've got everything the world can offer you. Great career, great wage, nice house, perfect looking family. You even, you know, you're you're almost like you're quite comfortable and yet there's still something nagging inside of you that says there's more. The thing I love about this Chosen series is yes, we get to see Jesus from another angle, but we actually get to see ourselves because the thing about the Christian faith is that it's, it's actually about you as well as God. And today we're going to speak into that because there's something all these characters had in need that uh, had in common that I think we all share in common. And it's that ultimately we're all in need of something. At some point in our life, we're all in need of something. Matthew needs a way out. Simon needs provision. Nicodemus needs answers. I wonder what you're in need of today. Because actually some of us, we might even be in church because of a need. It's drawn us into this place because actually there is something that we have need of. There's one character that we meet in the very first episode whose need is very pronounced and very obvious. And it is the incredible Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary is a really important character, not just in this version of the TV series, but actually in the Gospels themselves. 
Because this Mary is one of a number of women who Jesus brings right into the core of his mission and his ministry. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, in such a chauvinistic society that marginalized women, brings women and says, I believe in you. I want to bring you right into the center of what I'm doing. I want to release you. I want to use you. And the reason why Mary is so profound is because of where we meet her in her life. She's broken She needs so much more. She doesn't just need answers. She doesn't need just a bit of money to get her out of debt. She needs freedom at its most core and root level. And we're going to take a look at the very opening scenes of episode one of The Chosen, where we meet Mary in the series. Sleeping, little one. Come sleep. Sit down. Sit down. Is your head hurting you again? No. No. I know. You are thinking of the big new star. Hey, look, it's right there. You see? No. Why can't you sleep? I'm scared. Of what? I don't know. Hey, what do we do when we are scared? We say the words. Adonai's words. From the prophet? Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, right. Thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not. Come now. I want to hear you sing. I want to hear your pretty voice. Come. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are mine. That's right. so powerful to see somebody in such a point of desperation. But Mary was, when we meet her in the Bible, was at the darkest point of her life. You know, we as a church understand that we can reach these dark points in our life for many different reasons. But Mary's was just all-encompassing. Sometimes it's the choices we make. Sometimes it's the circumstances. But Mary's issue is deeper than that. It was even spiritual. And the Bible said that she was actually in this place of needing deliverance. Now, deliverance can be a word that sometimes confuses us. If we live in certain cultures, it might have been pigeonholed. But really what it really means is that she needed rescue. And she needed rescue on the most fundamental level of freedom. It wasn't just that she couldn't pay her bills. It wasn't just that she was stuck in the middle with no option. It wasn't just that she didn't have the answer. She needed it at the deepest point in her life. The Bible says that she actually, that her problems were so deep that they were, had a spiritual hold. As a church, we know that we believe in God as good, but we also know that there's this enemy, the devil, and actually he even had this hold on her life. And whatever she did, whether she tried this or she tried that, she just couldn't get out of that situation. She needed rescue. She needed rescue where nobody else could do it. There she was. She'd been, we don't know the circumstance of her life, but I'm sure it wasn't just by her own means. Things happen, challenges, abuse, all these different things. There's so much of this in our world. Mary's such a picture of where we find ourselves in our world today. That's why it's so important that we need Jesus. Because do you know what? Matthew could have gone and read a leadership book and gotten some like little tactics out. Simon could have taken a loan from the bank. Nicodemus could have gone and gotten another answer. But Mary's problem is even more fundamental. She needs something that nobody else can give her, that only Jesus can do. 
Should we take a look at the moment where he brings that into her life? Take a look at this. So, did it work? I'm sorry, Lilith. Elias? What? We should talk, huh? Leave me alone. Oh, what, huh? He's going to scratch me, too. No, come on. Not now. So, see. Not now. She smells anyway. I don't know what else I can do to help you. Give me that. Lots of it. That's not going to solve your problems. It's meant to distract from no them. No more preaching. Just give it to me. Lilith, please listen to what I'm says the Lord who created you and he who formed you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You We're all in need of rescue. What I love about this scene is that he knows her name. Whatever your rescue is today, he's calling your name. He's calling to us, even in the darkest moments of our lives. But you know, today, I want us to talk about what Mary really discovered. Because in this moment where she receives her freedom, just like Simon Peter receives his when Jesus provides, and Matthew his when Jesus gives a way out, there's something more that they got, something more that they discovered that's even more deep and essential to our lives. You see, we're all in need of rescue, but there's something that these guys discovered. And it wasn't just their rescue. It wasn't just what they needed. It was who they needed. You see, in life, is, is your life really about what you need 
Or is it about who you need? The reality is, is that the disciples didn't just find their rescue, they found their rescuer. You know, Mary didn't just find her deliverance, she found her deliverer. Simon didn't just find his, provide, his provision, he found his provider. Matthew didn't just find his way out, he found his leader. There is something in this, this series that God wants to do. He doesn't just want to bring the fruit of who he is. He wants to bring the very nature of who he is into our lives. You see, the reality is, as I said earlier, is our life about what we need or is it really about who we need? You see, so many of us, we're looking to Jesus to do something for us, but actually the answer is who he is to us. You know, um, I, I recently kind of had an experience that challenged me. I was waiting at home for a delivery and uh, I was, I'd ordered something on a website that I regularly order and so they use this particular delivery uh, service and so the person that comes and delivers to our house is the same person every time. So I recognise them, they recognise me and so I got the email through saying, hey, your delivery is going to be here between 3.30 and 4.30, click on the link to track the package. And so I did that and the face of my, del- my familiar delivery driver came up and uh, but but lo and behold, I noticed his name for the first time because his name was Dave Thomas. <laughs> he literally had the same name as me. But here was the challenge. Here was what God challenged. He said, you've never wanted to know his name because all you've ever been interested in is what he's bringing you. Right? It was such a t- And we live in this world where we're consumed with what we can get rather than who's going to bring it to us. We're consumed with what we want rather than who's bringing it. You see, right, it's amazing to see this moment with Mary where she receives her freedom. It's profound. And God wants to move in that way through this series in our church. But actually, there's something even more profound that he wants to do. And he actually wants to bring himself into our lives and actually be our deliverer, not just give us our deliverance. Be our provider, not just give us our provision. Be our healer, not just bring us our healing. And I'm not saying that looking for those things is wrong. Time and time again, Jesus seeks out people just like he did Mary. But there's something that God's calling us to do in how we seek him out. So I want you to write this question down. Is life more about what you need or who you need? Because so many of us, the the centre of our Christian, our following of Jesus so often can become about what we need or what we want. But actually it's about who we need. You know, going back to this idea of the people that deliver things to us, often we don't care about who they are until they mess up. (laughs) Don't it, right? We don't mind not knowing their name when they bring it on time. But when it's an hour late, you're phoning them and say, I want their name. Who's late? Who's late? Do you know what? Often, you know, we can miss what God's doing within us because we're waiting for him to do it the way we want and what we want. Even the Pharisees, the people that were looking for Jesus, couldn't recognise him because he wasn't doing what they wanted the way we want. I want to ask you today, what are you missing in life that Jesus might be doing because he's not doing what you want the way you want? You see, when we're looking for who Jesus is, rather than what he can do the way we want him to do it, I actually think we see more of what Jesus can do in our lives. The times I've been prescribing what I want him to do, the way I want him to do it, often are the times that I've been disappointed. But the times that I've pursued who he is, is often the times that I've seen him move in my life in miraculous ways. You know, we don't just see this in, you know, it's not just a modern thing. In John chapter 6, we see this moment which just after Jesus has fed the 5,000 and in reality he's fed 15, 20,000 people, right? And it's an incredible miracle. But then in verse, I believe it's verse 30, they come and they say, what sign are you going to give us, Jesus, so that we can believe? Right? These guys have just seen him do an amazing miracle and yet they're coming back and saying, what, what are you going to do next so we believe? What are we going to do next? How many times have I done that in my life? You know, I've seen this amazing thing. I've experienced something. But there's this insatiable desire for more. But what we're really saying to Jesus is keep proving yourself. So we actually have an issue with who he is in prescribing what he should do and how he should do it. Do you know, Jesus answers. He doesn't come back and say, oh, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to raise the dead. I'm going to do this. In fact, he actually comes back with really tough teaching. 
And then in John chapter 6, verse 60, the, it's, it's said that they say, this is a hard teaching. And most of the disciples walk away. They literally can't, say, they stop following him. And then in verse 66, Jesus, in verse 67, Jesus turns to the disciples and says, do you want to go too? But the response of the disciples shows what they really discovered. Let's have a look at it in John chapter 6, um, verse 67 um, in uh, the NIV. It says this, Simon Peter, sorry, verse 68 says, Lord, to whom shall we go? It's about connection. You have the words of eternal life. It's like you're teaching the way you're leading me, the way you're bringing me forward. It's eternal, it's life to me. But then he goes this, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Simon Peter had a revelation of who Jesus was, not just what Jesus could do. Simon Peter's following of Jesus was centered around who Jesus was, not just what Jesus could do. You see, we're all in need of rescue, but we're more in need of relationship. We are all in need of rescue, but we're actually more in need of relationship. The thing that was different about Matthew and Simon and Mary wasn't just that God healed them, set them free, provided for them, delivered them, healed them, whatever it was. It was that they actually connected to the ultimate need in their souls. And that was a relationship with their creator, their maker. You see, right at the core of the human problem is a relationship problem, not a healing problem, not a provision problem. Not a deliverance problem, not a, not a circumstantial problem. It's actually a relational problem. It's actually a connection problem. The Bible teaches us, doesn't it? For many of us are familiar with this, that God created us for relationship. But through our own decisions, we're distant from Him. What was that? It's a relationship problem. And I believe as I was preparing this, one of the things that God is calling us as a church is to become consumed, not by wanting more from Him, but by wanting more of him. And here's the amazing thing. If we as a people, as a community, and as a church become consumed in wanting more of him, I actually believe and totally believe we'll see more from him. You see, here's the thing. Those people that walked away because Jesus wasn't doing what they wanted the way they wanted, they never saw Lazarus raised from the dead. They never saw the blind sea. They never saw those things. They actually didn't experience the thing that they were looking for because they didn't have that relational connection. You see, when we center our following of Jesus around who he is to us, we'll actually see way more of the things that we want from him. And that's not why we do it, but there's just such an incredible reality that as you center your life around who Jesus is, you will actually see more of the things and the power and the healing and the deliverance. See, what I want is I want, if you need healing, I want you to come and receive that healing in Jesus. If you need breakthrough, if you need deliverance, you need rescue, you need provision, you need answers, like all these different people, I want you to find it in him. But I don't just want you to find that. I actually want you to find that and him. I don't just want you to find it in him. I want you to find that and him because that's the thing that will really sustain you. What took Peter all the way to, you know, his end and his death? It was the relationship. Why was Mary there in the tomb when she was the first person that Jesus revealed himself to? Why was she there? Not running in fear of her own death. It's because of relationship. She wasn't there chasing another miracle. She wasn't there chasing another breakthrough. She was actually there trying to find the person she loved. Matthew, why does he follow him? Because it's actually discovered the person he loved, that relationship. And in this chosen series, we have an opportunity, not just to discover our rescue, our healing, our provision, but actually our rescuer, our healer, and our provider. So I wanna ask you, what are you looking for in your faith and in your following of Jesus. Be really honest with yourself. Are you actually looking for your rescuer or really your rescue? You know, I find this so challenging. The number of times when Saz and I are in a position of need, like provision, and we're we're praying, and maybe we're fasting, and then we have the breakthrough. And I've, listen, I'm just gonna be honest. Maybe I'm just the worst Christian in the world. But let's say God brings that money. So often I've then been spending that money before I thanked him for it. Anybody ever done that? 
where we, God does something in our lives, but then we're so quickly on to the next thing, the next want, the next need. But actually, Jesus wants us to center him, wants us to center our lives around who he is, not just what he can do for us. So I want to give you a couple of different ways of how. Because I want us not just to sort of realize, okay, yeah, I want that. I need a sense of my life around who he is. I want us to know how. So I'm going to give you a couple of things. And some of these are going to apply to you. Others may not. But the first one is this. If you want to be able to center your life around Jesus and who he is rather than what he can do for you, then you need to limit the number of situations or bad situations you get yourself into of your own accord. Let me explain what I mean by that. For me, in the early years of my faith, I would spend most of the worship time in church trying to forgive myself for what I did the night before that was actually my choice. Actually, do you know what? When we live healthy, when we're living in a right place, relationships thrive, don't they? Have you ever had it, whether you're married or you know, you're uh, in a close-knit group of friends, how much easier a relationship is when things are good? Yeah. Any married couples had bickers this week? We did. How much harder is your relationship to live out when, because you need, some, you need a breakthrough, you need a change. So one of the ways that we can actually look to build our lives around who Jesus is, is actually living as healthy as we possibly can. If you deal with your debt and you live in a, in a healthy place with your finances, you're not actually going to be coming to him for provision as much as you were before. This isn't about earning. This is, I'm talking about how do you build a life that's healthy where you can be more about who he is than what he can do for you. So I believe living healthily and building health into our lives is actually one of the ways that we can become more concentrated on who he is than what we need from him. Yeah, it's, it's just something, it's, I, I really want to empower you because, I, you know, it's so easy when like, yeah, I need to put Jesus at the center of my life. I need to be consumed with who he is rather than what he can, but how? Because I don't know about you, probably before the end of the day, I'm going to pray a, I need you to do this Jesus prayer, yeah. right? So what power do you have in your life to eliminate the needs you're coming to him for? Because some of the things we're coming to him for are actually the result of our own choices, Right? Some of the things we're coming to him for, we can actually change. And we're saying, Lord, provide. And he's saying, control, control your spending. You know, we're saying, Lord, provide. And he's saying, get a job. Yeah. A number of people who say, yeah, I'm just praying. I'm just believing for provision. I'm like, have you done anything toward that provision? Right? But when you're in a place of need that you can do something about, do something about it. If it's you're resting in your heart with unforgiveness, forgive. If you're wrestling with your heart in pride, confess it. And what it does, it actually creates space for your relationship with Jesus to be about Him more than about what you need. Honestly, there's such a little secret in this. It's not about condemnation. It's about having that space. And so the second thing, and um, it's a bit of a, you know, maybe a religious word, but there's something so powerful about this, Sabbath. Now, if you're new to church, right, you might be thinking, oh my God, what is that? It's actually the Jewish word that encompasses the idea and also the command, that's an important thing, to have a day of rest a week dedicated to God. One of the things I love about the first and second episodes of The Chosen is that when you see these people about to Sabbath, they can't wait for it. They're so excited. It's, a, it's not a day of, I've got to have a day off because I'm you know, a bad person. There is this, this excitement to enjoy it. One of the first things Mary does after she's set free from Jesus is goes and enjoys the Sabbath. If that is not a picture of a breakthrough need and now her life is about who Jesus is, then I don't know what it is, right? Now, me and Saz, over the last year, we've been really trying to fight to become people that Sabbath, that really do have this dedicated space of a day of rest, which we celebrate Jesus in. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't build the church. It doesn't mean we don't witness to people. It doesn't mean we sit at home and don't do anything, don't lift the, you know, it's not about being religious in that. But guys, it's been transformative because actually when you Sabbath, it changes the rest of your week. I realized that if I worked 100 mile an hour all the way through to Friday evening, it was often Saturday afternoon before I'd really switched off. It was actually Saturday afternoon before I'd actually even been able to focus on Jesus, give him any of my heart and my attention. And so now I actually work differently. 
The way I answer my emails is different. The way I plan my diary is different because I want to be with my family and my saviour on that Sabbath. The reality is, is when we don't discipline that in, we don't discover that. And it's challenging. Some of us, we've got to work on the weekend. Some of us, we've got lots going on. But can I implore you to fight to discover what your Sabbath looks like? Maybe it's a Saturday for you. Maybe it's a Sunday. Maybe it's going to be a different day of the week because you might be involved in things um, of a ministry nature. But there's something about taking and making that space that helps center your life around who Jesus is not what he can do for you or even what you can do for him. Next little tip that I want to give you is remember him in the good times. How much of my prayer life is centered around what I need rather than celebrating when things are good? Do you know what? If you're having a party and it's a great party and you're eating some great food or you are watching a great sunset, include him in it. Thank him for it. There's another one. Thank him as much as you ask him. If you and I thank, if we thank Jesus as much as we ask Jesus, it will gradually reorientate our life to being more about who he is than what he can do. And notice what I'm saying there. I'm not saying that we don't need him to do things for us. I'm not saying we shouldn't come to him and ask for those things. That's an essential part of our faith. But I'm saying that something Mary and Matthew and Simon discovered is that the, the, it was actually to be more about who he is. More about who than about what. More about of him than about from him. And like I said, again, I'm going to keep repeating it. If we become a community obsessed with that, we're going to see more healing in our, in our cities. We're going to see more deliverance. We're going to see more miracle provision. Because when you're around Jesus, you can't help but experience the fruit of Jesus. But when you're just looking for the fruit, sometimes you don't get either. Sometimes you don't get the provision or the presence because we're just too focused on what we want from him. So remember him in the good times. Thank him as much as you ask him. And one of the things that I find so helpful to center my life around who Jesus is, is literally serving him, doing what he wants me to do. Loving my neighbour, reaching my friends. You know, when we think about our lives being centred around what he can do for us and what we can get from him, it's often around the things we want him to do. Well, flip it and make your life about what he wants you to do. And when you get active in doing what he wants you to do, you'll actually find that his presence and who he is is much more at the centre of who you are. Again, I'm not saying any of these things come easily and I'm not saying that they are a fail safe, you know, it's always gonna win. But what I'm saying is that something is gonna apply for us. And if you wanna make your life about who he is, then there's something in these areas. But one of the biggest things for me is about focusing on him. And we live in one of the most distracted eras of human history, don't we? There's something about focusing on Jesus and dealing with our distractions. Because I don't know about you, if I sit down to have time with Jesus, I I couldn't tell you the number of times the WhatsApp comes in, the work WhatsApp, the email, the bill comes through the door. We've got to be people that shut out the noise every single day because the noise will always drive you to need something from him. Whereas actually, when you deal with the distraction, it helps you focus on something of him. So I want you to ask this question. What are the key distractions in my life that get in the way of being centered around who Jesus is? We'll all have different distractions. And arresting your key one is so, so powerful in your life. Hebrews 12, let's take a look at that. It's such a brilliant verse. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2, something so uh, familiar for many of us, but I love this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's just pause there. Who's in that cloud? Matthew, Simon, Mary, they're there going, focus on him, focus on him, make your life about him. This cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. And this is it, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer 
and the perfecter of our faith. Let's just look at that equation. equation. When you fix your eyes on Jesus, he will perfect your faith and he will provide. You see, focus leads to what we're looking for from him so many times, time and time again. Throughout this chosen series, there's an invitation, yes, to ask God for the miraculous. Yes, to see him provide. Yes, to see him heal. Yes, to see him break through. And I cannot wait to hear more and more stories of when he does that. But ultimately at the root, it's an invitation to make our lives about who he is. What are you gonna do this week? What are you gonna change tomorrow? Is it about some habit that you have the power to change so that you can eradicate a need so it's one less thing to ask him about? What about, is it a habit of dealing with a distraction? How are you and I going to fix our eyes on Jesus? Because I truly, truly, truly believe that as we make our lives about who he is, we'll see more of what he can do in our lives. The invitation for deliverance, the invitation for healing, the invitation provision is the second one. The first one is the invitation to relationship. And so as we wrap up here today around our locations, our location leaders are going to jump up now. And they're going to give you the most incredible opportunity. It's an invitation of a relationship with Jesus. It's the ultimate thing that can answer your ultimate needs is to have that whole relationship with him. I hope that you enjoy watching The Chosen this week. Dig into, go rewatch episode one. There's profound, amazing moments where we see the rescuer coming in, but ultimately people connecting to their rescuer. It's been great to join you. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a great week this week. Thank you.